Well, that's uh, Dell's Trevor Libri there, and uh, thanks, Trevor. We're going to be connecting back to you very soon, and uh, I'll see you back. And for those of you who just plugged in, this is uh, hashtag CISO Summit 2022. That's where we are on LinkedIn and uh, Twitter, and I welcome you to join the conversation there. And um, I've been told that there are some great giveaways there as well. So out you go. Uh, surging forward and uh, strengthening our defense here in the summit. And uh, please now welcome Richard Steenen, the chief research analyst at IT Harvest. And he's going to be talking to us about the changing dimension of security operations and analytics. Over to you, Mr. Steenan. All right, thank you so much. Well, hello, everybody. I'm Richard Steenan. I'm a industry analyst, and I spend a lot of every year producing a new security yearbook. So it's an annual publication that not only summarizes the history of the industry, but includes data on this year, 2,850 vendors of cybersecurity products. And very important to realize, because the question I get most often is, hey, how come this company is not in your book? <clears throat> it's because I only focus on companies that produce products and sell them. So I don't cover open source. Um, I don't cover consultants. Um, I don't cover cyber insurance, right? So the industry is a lot bigger than just what I focus on. But as an industry analyst, I'm interested in those vendors that are building stuff to help us fight the constant scourge of cyber attacks. And I love the theme of Dynamic CISO conference this year uh, because it ties in with a, I guess, a revelation I had about last year's growth. And I think that we're finally seeing the industry turn towards countering targeted attacks, which is a good because I'm also writing a book on cyber defense and countering targeted attacks. So all good stuff. Let me start by giving you the 2021 snapshots, right? So there are 2,850 vendors in our space. $26 billion of new investment went into a total of 475 companies last year. There were 405 acquisitions, so exits. So we've got new investments, you know, and the investors hope that there will be exits, either IPOs or uh, acquisitions, strategic or selling to a private equity company. Um, <clears throat> six of those acquisitions were by special purpose acquisition corporations, which are a special form of, of uh, investment. Um, and if you towed up the number of people who work at all 2,850 vendors, you get one and three quarter million people work in this industry. So it's come a long way since I got into it in 1995, um, when there were maybe three companies uh, worldwide. And now, of course, we've come a long way. So if you break the vendors down, and I'm the only one in the world who does that, right? Captures all the vendors and then categorizes them. So there are plenty of sites uh, for information on companies in general, and you'll search them for cybersecurity and they'll give you 6,000 results. I've done that on all the sites that do that and I've gone through them. And usually they have maybe 100, 150 that I don't have, but they also have four or 5,000 that aren't security companies, right? They don't fit my definition of vendor and their classification is always wrong. So they, you know, the big research firms just cut and paste whatever the vendor says they are. And today it's, it's kind of difficult to do that. For instance, uh, if you went to look at the 92 companies that I have in the threat intelligence space, none of them say threat intelligence on their websites anymore. They all say digital risk protection. So they're protecting digital risks, which of course is nonsensical and it's just because Gartner needed a three-letter acronym and CTI, Cyber Threat Intelligence, wasn't good enough. Interestingly, this is the first year that I've been tracking this uh, over the last 10 years where GRC had the most number of vendors in it. And there's probably a lot of reasons for that. GRC is a pretty low um, barrier to entry business to get into, right? You just turn a spreadsheet um, or an asset management platform that used to be a spreadsheet, now is a, a SaaS product. Um, you just add risk metrics to it and you have a GRC product. 
Also, data security uh, is about the same size, and that's because there's so many vendors that do encryption or they do key management or they do uh, data vaults. Um, so they kind of apply data security um, or they're doing data discovery um, for with a security flavor to it. Uh, all those fit into that bucket. Um, network security has fallen to third place. First time I put this together, it was in first place. Uh, and uh, I think a little bit of that is, is that the network security industry is being disrupted by the cloud. So the, the old um, need in practically every region or country in the world for a uh, standalone appliance, a UTM product, uh, is going away as people just connect directly to the cloud and they start using cloud proxies like Zscaler. But of course, CyberRoam was a great example of an Indian startup that sold to Sophos. Um, and, a, and there's dozens of other UTM vendors still around, but <clears throat> they're all challenged by what Zscaler, Cato, Netscope are doing in the cloud. So that's just that little bit of uh, overview. When you start to look at the growth per category, this is where it got interesting last year. So for the first time ever, I've got all my data in a database, which gives me a lot more power to quickly generate charts like this. Um, so you can see the number of vendors in each category, great. The number of vendors that were funded, and not only did, does GRC have the most vendors, it has easily the most, by factor of three, the most that got funding last year. Um, but if you do the math, you know, the total funding was 1.5 billion, divided amongst 159 companies. So the average funding amount was lower than in the hotter spaces. Data security um, actually took in more funding, but for fewer companies. So that some of the, you know, a data security company is going to have something new to get investors interested. So they're going to pour uh, more money into each company. But as you go down uh, the right-hand column is their growth in total employment which I use as a proxy for growth in revenue. That doesn't totally line up because when a company takes in a lot of investment, it tends to hire people, uh, get out ahead of its revenue, but eventually though, you know, the more people they hire and the bigger their sales team, the more revenue they get. So the math works out in the long run. Um, but if you'd look down through that column, you see that the fastest growing segment in my estimation, is operations security, so SecOps. And how do I think of operations security? It's basically all the tools that a, a secure operations center, a SOC, needs to do its job and tools that will improve the efficacy of what they do. It helps them with threat hunting. It helps them prioritize alerts. Um, all those tools uh, fit into operational security in my book. Uh, and adjacent to that is security analytics. So it is SOCs that buy security analytic products, but I needed a place for SIM to end up because I used to put SIM in GRC, which wasn't really fair to the SIM vendors, um, even though you know the primary use case for SIM product was, hey, my ISO or COBIT or ITIL requires me to keep logs. Um, so I need a SIM product to do that, right? Something a little better than just a pure logging product. And But I moved them into security analytics because a lot is going on there, right? Uh, companies are pulling in other data you know, to the SIM and running much, much better tools against it. Uh, it's kind of evolving into XDR, right? Which is a combination of NDR and EDR uh, and user behavior analysis and threat intelligence. You put it all together and you've got security analytics, but note that security analytics grew 19% last year. So if you combine operations and security analytics, you've got a very, very hot space. Um, still small with operations um, only having 44,000 employees and analytics 49,000, but growing faster than the rest of the segments. And I am actually elated to see that going on. <clears throat> 2024, one funding uh, was out of this world, right? Is more than twice what it was the previous year. It was definitely record setting um, with, you know, more than 67 companies took in 100 million or more last year. And, you know, so you look at any company that takes in $100 million, 
it's probably going to have close to a billion dollar or more valuation. Some of these were valued at eight billion dollars. Um, they obviously are on the path to becoming new public companies. So exciting time to be tracking the space. M and A is uh, was also um, at uh, record high levels, three hundred four acquisitions. Um, and then, you know, I continue the story. I've been tracking McAfee since their inception. So I have to keep adding to the history of McAfee as it goes through its various gyrations. It's kind of in its last gyration now uh, because the enterprise business has been sold to uh, a private equity group that also bought the FireEye products and they're lumping them together in something called Trellix. And then an investment group bought the rest of McAfee, the consumer side. Uh, offering $14 billion for it. Um, but that means that it'll no longer be public sometime in the first quarter of this year. So McAfee, you know, as an enterprise brand, is pretty much gone already. So, <clears throat> so let's talk about targeted attacks and defense against them. And the revelation I had, kind of the aha moment when I visited Lockheed Martin's uh, Security Operations Center. <clears throat> So this is a headline from a story written by Andy Greenberg, um, uh, written just last May, where he reveals the full story of the stunning RSA hack. And it's really, you know, even though that hack occurred um, 10 years before, it it was stunning. At the time, it was stunning. Um, and I, I talked to the CISO at RSA, uh, interviewed him for my book on cyber defense. And it was uh, quite revealing to understand what it's like when you recognize that one, something doesn't seem right here. You know, there's something going on on a server that ended up in our SIM and our NetWitness product at the time identified some weird traffic. There might be something going on here. Let's do some threat hunting, figure it out. And then it was like, oh my God, somebody is targeting the, our secret file of the seeds for our primary product, which was the secure ID one-time password tokens. So which have been targeted for decades. People, you know, researchers have tried to demonstrate how, you know, kind of the random number generator in these things could be somehow uh, cracked by putting it in a microwave oven or etching the chips in the device. And once you had the secret seed, you could generate the next number that showed on the little device for 60 seconds. <clears throat> so you could then get into the, you know, high, highly protected secure operations of any company if you only had those secure seats. Well, RSA got whacked. Um, they saw the data leaving their network and they, you know, hit a big red button and literally shut off all network access while that was going on. And they, at the time, they actually told the SEC and published a press release saying, you know, our we're going to work with all of our customers to reseed all their devices or replace all their devices, um, but really not to worry because the likelihood of this use being used in a real attack is super, super small. Just not a problem. Well, a month later, Lockheed Martin saw somebody logging in, authenticated, you know, over the VPN, with a with the secure ID tokens that they used, and they recognized that it was you know a unwanted login, that it was a an attacker logging in. They shut off all remote access immediately to seventy thousand employees. And the question in my mind was, wait a minute, how can you detect an unauthorized login with because of a secure ID token. So I went to visit Lockheed and I saw a security operations center that was different from anything I've ever seen before. They track attackers by their progress they're making through the cyber kill chain. So a white paper was written by Lockheed Martin about the cyber kill chain, very, very similar to the MITRE attack uh, process. And they, they look at teams of attackers that they can identify as belonging to the same group because they use the same methods, they uh, attack at the same time of day, any geolocation might lead them back to the same place. All these identifiers they use to say, you know what, that activity that we see, which is definitely malicious, is probably associated with this team, and they track it by stage in, in the cyber kill chain. So they say, hey, these guys 
started with reconnaissance six months ago. Um, now they're attempting lateral motion within our organization. Uh, we have to beef up defenses and start fighting back harder. And they have been tracking 18 attributed to China uh, for months. And all of a sudden, members of that team were trying to log in with secure ID uh, uh, one-time password tokens. That's all they needed to know to shut off access. And my big aha was, wow, in order to counter targeted attacks, you know, by these professional groups, namely nation states and their intelligence services and military services, everybody's going to have to get to the same level. And I hadn't seen much sign of that actually happening, right? I haven't seen products come along that actually extract data and try and collate it into attacking teams and line it up with what today would be the MITRE attack scenario. I haven't seen that, but I believe that security operations centers are just being pulled along and drafting and discovering in their own way the best way to counter these continuous cyber attacks. So let's look at the uh, SecOps leader leaderboard. So I you know, filtered out the companies that had grown 700% because they went from you know one person to eight people because um, that's still not super interesting. But man, no, no matter how you cut it last year, Orca Security, which does cloud posture management, so you know, very fast growing space, grew 267% last year. And at the end of January had 275 employees. So good size company. They've taken in 482 million, including two rounds that added up to $400 million last year. So they're valued at over $2 billion now um, and just on a roll. And because they add to a organization that's going down the digital transformation path, Orca Security adds you know, basically everything you need to monitor and protect your cloud assets. So if an organization is moving away from their data center, they're gonna put things in the cloud and have a single pane of glass in order to check configurations and monitor activity. Jupiter One is another company in the cloud posture management space, uh, grew 188%, um, but is you know, less than half the size and only took in a paltry $30 million last year, which is actually enough. Right, it's you know maybe they'll get their 400 million investment next year. Other ones in this space, Huntress Labs, a company called Simulate, which does breach and attack simulation. Uh, interestingly enough, Multigo. So you know I usually don't track open source because Multigo is an open source analyst notebook for threat hunting and and doing the link analysis of uh, threat actors. Multigo Technologies is a commercial. Uh, organization that provides support and enhancements for Multigo, the open source. Uh, and they grew 96% last year with no funding that I know of. Um, so that's pretty good sign that Multigo is doing really, really well. Um, some of the bug bounty programs I would include in uh, SecOps as well. Uh, there's yet another cloud posture management company that grew 71% Tetrate. Um, and it just goes on. We just keep seeing the growth in SecOps happening in our industry. Now, if you cut it with a slightly different filter, uh, which is leaderboard by new funding, you once again, Orca's at the top, right? They're one of the most highly funded companies last year. Um, but you get other companies like Landsweeper, who is a asset discovery solution, also super valuable for security operations. Um, a Chinese company that does asset discovery and protection, um, you know, reversing labs that does malware, automated uh, malware analysis, also something that's needed. That's uh, Lockheed Martin did a lot of their own uh, malware analysis. Uh, of course, it was back in the days when you know, they had to rely on Semantic and McAfee for malware analysis that wasn't fast enough because even back then, uh, Semantic and McAfee said, you know, we don't, we won't write a signature for something that's targeted at you because that doesn't help the rest of our customers because nobody will ever see it. Uh, so why keep adding to our signature base? So companies like Lockheed had to do their own. Uh, so that's why when I see somebody like Reversing Labs uh, growing well, getting funding, 
um, that because they're keyed into this new opportunity to help secure op operations groups. And simulate hunter slabs appeared in this filter as well. So that's kind of the, you know, I'm excited that uh, countering targeted attacks is finally coming into its own. Uh, it's going to push down, right? But obviously the Lockheeds and the big banks, the rest of the defense industrial base all have to be doing this today. Um, ultimately, we'll all have to be doing it in some way, but come on, a small manufacturer isn't going to be able to find, uh, hire, and retain a team of 12 people to watch their network. So we're going to outsource to managed security service providers and MDR providers and managed XDR providers. Um, but they'll all have to acquire tools in order to do uh, good security operations. So some of the things I'm watching for 2022, uh, API security. I think I've uh, tracked 14 vendors that are targeting this market for you know, just a whole new realm of vulnerabilities. And that is the way that people tie all their applications together. Over 60% of network traffic on the internet is actually API uh, traffic. Uh, so we're at that stage where attackers are going to start recognizing that in searching for API gateways and trying to steal data that way. And luckily, you know, there's 14 vendors that are ready to move in that market. I'm also watching moving target defense. You know, there's uh, always an appeal to a technologist when you see uh, something as cool as a solution that actually rebuilds a VM or container every 60 seconds. Uh, making it impossible to hack manually, for sure, right? So an attacker would say, oh, hey, Kubernetes is vulnerable, or this instance of VMware is vulnerable, I'm going to hack into it with these command lines. Well, you got 60 seconds to get a foothold and do something with it before you've got to start over because the machine was just replaced. Um, so moving target defense is really cool stuff. Um, and so I'm just tracking it, see what happens. And finally, when you talk about targeted attacks coming in through a supply chain, which frankly was the attack on RSA because the target was actually Lockheed Martin. And even RSA was attacked from a uh, human resources, you know, health benefits company. And the initial foothold came in through a spreadsheet shared amongst RSA uh, um, employees from that company. Um, Solar Winds was an example of the ultimate supply chain attack where the attackers attributed to uh, uh, Russian military uh, intelligence agencies uh, infiltrated the uh, DevOps uh, operations of Solar Winds and added code to the official release package that was sent out to 18,000 customers. So how do you stop that? Well, you know, so far everybody's talking about solar winds and all of the solar winds of the world, of which there's probably over 100,000 providers of software to enterprise, all of them just have to do a better job of DevSecOps. Uh, they have to shift left. They have to do code reviews. You know, oh, oh, that's great. You know, yes, no question, software assurance is a critical function everybody should be investing in. But as a customer of enterprise software, what are you going to do? You're already checking hashes, digital signatures, um, maybe locking down your firewall rules so only the update server at the supplier can connect to the server on your side. All well and good unless that code has been hacked in production before it gets to you. How do you check it? So I'm keeping an eye out for vendors that talk about, hey, we're, we can reverse engineer uh, that code and look for changes that have been made that might, you know, open up uh, ports or open up doors or, or phone home through command and control networks. Haven't seen anything like that yet, uh, but it's on its way. It's got to happen. So that's my quick snapshot of the entire cybersecurity industry and the exciting news that security operations is the fastest growing segment of that industry. And I hope you learned a lot.